Hello and welcome to Ashgrove Online. My name's Dave and I'm the senior pastor here at the church. And I'm glad that you've joined with us today. And I want you to know that we're a church that values community, living in authentic relationship with each other. And in this season, it might look a little different, but it's not impossible. It starts right here with you connecting in for church online. So wherever you are in the journey of life, I'm glad that you've joined with us today. And if you'd like to get in touch with me or one of the pastors, please head over to the Contact Us tab at our website, ashgrove.org.au. But for now, stay tuned. Ashgrove Online will start in just a few moments. Hang here punished for my heinous crimes that I'm guilty of and yet even in these moments of my death my life has truly begun. The smell and the disgust of the prison cell is still etched in my mind. Surrounded by inmates who had caused trouble during the uprising and both myself and the man who hangs on the side of me here were on death row and today was to be our day, we were to be crucified. Today was my very last chance to be pardoned and outside in the courtyard we could hear the festival taking place and I knew because I had once stood there as a free man that Pilate would enact his regular custom and ask the people, which prisoner do you want to release? And everything in me wanted to be free. I hoped with every fibre of my being that they would shout my name. If it wasn't my name today, I knew within hours I would be hanging here. And so we all pressed in against the bars of the cell trying to hear who they were calling for. But all we could hear was crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, crucify who? The, the custom was to release someone, not to condemn someone. And they added his name. Crucify Jesus. Crucify Jesus, they said. And it got louder and louder and I can still hear it ringing in my ears. I didn't even know who this Jesus guy was. I remember Pilate saying, but he's done nothing wrong. But their shouts seemed to pound louder and louder. And then as if by some strange persuasion of the crowd, Barabbas is suddenly being called for. Barabbas? This makes no sense. He was just as guilty as I was. Barabbas was the ringleader in all of this. Had they forgotten that? They called for Barabbas to be released and Jesus to be crucified. And then, just like it was a normal thing for an innocent man to be condemned, Pilate is sending Jesus along with the two of us to be executed. And Barabbas, the murderer, he he just walked out of the cell, a free man. We were taken to the praetorium and, and beaten and the cuts into my flesh are excruciatingly painful. They spat on us and whipped us and mocked us and flogged us as if the crucifixion itself wasn't going to be painful enough. They had to lord it over us and remind us that we were worthless. And I was so angry. I've murdered before and in that moment I could have ripped off someone's head. I was yelling at them and swearing at them and, and, and taking swings to try and hurt them. But not Jesus. Jesus just stood there and he allowed them and they vandalized his body. He cried out in pain. There was no anger in his eyes, no retaliation in his hands. We were led out of Pilate's palace, barely recognizable, dragging these heavy crosses. And we were forced to walk up onto this hill, Golgotha, the place of the skull. There were people everywhere. 
Originally, I thought they were here to watch me receive this justice for my sin. But that thought quickly changed. As Jesus walked in front of me, I got a glimpse of just how much he had been flogged. It was gruesome. And I've seen some gruesome things in my life before. But this was like nothing else. Parts of his muscles had been torn away from the bone. He was bloodied and bruised and his organs were exposed. They really, really tortured him far greater and harder and stronger than they touched us. As we walked down the roads, the crowd grew bigger and bigger. And the soldiers had to fight off people wanting to run onto the street. They wanted to embrace him and comfort him. Some tried to fall in reverence at his feet. This man was popular. And as I looked up, there were people hanging from their windows and others standing on roofs just to catch a glimpse of him. And the weeping, oh, the weeping was overwhelming. Women and children crying at the sight of this man, Jesus. It was like my cellmate and I didn't even exist. No one was here for us. If it wasn't for the chains around our ankles, we could have easily just slipped away into the growing crowd. Not everyone liked him. As devastated as some people seemed to be watching him suffer, there were others who kept jeering and hurling their insults at him. It was such a mixture of emotions and reactions. When we finally got to the top of this hill, they lifted us up on these crosses and they drove seven inch nails through the bones in our wrists and ankles and the agony was excruciating. The final insult of pain pounded these wounds as these heavy crosses dropped into this hole that had been dug out. And then the slow waiting game of death began. Pushing up to grasp for a small amount of air grinds these long nails in my wrists and my ankles against the bone. I can't describe the pain. Persians had invented death by crucifixion about 400 years ago, but the Romans, oh, the Romans perfected it. They made sure every single breath inhaled brought with it pain and sorrow. And let me assure you, it hurts. It is excruciating. It's such an awful way to die. And I've stood there and I've watched victims take days before they die. Eventually the soldiers come along and break your legs so you can't push up and you die of suffocation or heart failure, whichever comes first. If I'm honest, the truth is I have been looking forward to this moment because finally in my death I can be released from the guilt and the shame of my past. In death, I am free. Because at my core, I'm a heinous man. Everything within me is wicked. I have no friends and my family have all turned their backs on me. And I remember every single one of the crimes I've committed. Those I've robbed and the people I've wronged. The lies, the cheating, even the rages of anger and murder. And I'm so ashamed of who I've become. And the truth is, I don't deserve life. I know that. Have you ever felt that? Maybe your crimes aren't to the extent of mine, but we all feel the guilt and the shame over decisions we've made, the regrets that continue to niggle deep down in your heart and you can't seem to be free from them. But meeting Jesus today, this man who up until this moment had been completely unknown to me, Meeting him has changed everything for me. Meeting him has changed everything. There were a lot of people standing here at Golgotha, mostly those who were in anguish seeing this man they loved dying. And at one point I looked down and saw his mother weeping profusely. 
and yet the look in her eyes as she gazed upon her son was so understanding. People were here who had followed him closely and people he had apparently healed stood completely heartbroken. And at first my heart was angry towards him. If he really was who he claimed to be, the Son of God, then why were we hanging here dying? Why didn't he do something? Surely more than anyone he could have changed the current situation of grief that we're enduring. Standing right here at Golgotha's hill were teams of people who had been following him around. If this was the man he said he was, why was he allowing all of this to happen? I remember heaping my own insults on him. <gasps> Yet another example of my brokenness on display for everyone to observe. And at one point I heard him say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Who was he talking to? The thorns soldiers had placed on his head would have been digging into his skull and yet he appears to be looking up and talking to God. I haven't heard anyone refer to God as Father before. There was so much pain in his words and yet he asks for forgiveness for us. To offer forgiveness. We hung there jeering and mocking and abusing him, wanting to save ourselves, but his response was to seek forgiveness on our behalf. He had no sooner uttered those words when the Jewish leaders who were looking on laughed and said, he's saved others, let him save himself if he is the Christ, the chosen one. Saved others. The chosen one, I thought, was this man, the man everyone was talking about? Was this man, the one from Galilee, who had healed the blind? Was this the man who had forgiven the tax collector Zacchaeus, claiming that he'd been saved that day? Was this the man who had interrupted a funeral for a little girl and brought her back to life? Even the soldiers approached him, mocking him, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. It had to be him. What could he possibly have done wrong though? Why were they executing him for just being a man who was healed and helped and loved? Why were they abusing him for the good that he had done. My cellmate became more infuriated in this moment, heaping insults at Jesus, and the more he did it, the more the realization of what was happening right here in this moment became clear to me. This man is innocent. Not only is he innocent, he is who he says he is. He is the Son of God, and I am guilty. I am a murderer, and my heart is full of deceit and shame, but this man is innocent and so i said to my cellmate don't you get it he's hanging here because of what the people have done they were the ones crying out crucify him the penalty that has played out for us today is exactly what we deserved but he didn't deserve this he hasn't done anything wrong in fact he hung here next to us today, dying in the place where that crooked man, Barabbas, should have been hanging. And this realization softened everything in my heart. And at one point I turned to Jesus and I whispered, Jesus, after this day is over and we've crossed into death and you are in the presence of your God, your Father. Please remember me. And in his pain, in his anguish, he turned to me with eyes of love and compassion. And he gasped for breath and he said the most humbling thing to me. He said, today you will be with me in my father's house. And in that very moment, my life began. My real life began. It was like the innocence of a child was washed over me. 
and the shame and regret that I had felt for so long was lifted from my shoulders. No one has ever loved me like that, especially someone like me. But something felt changed in my life. In these last few moments of my life, I am more alive than I have ever been. Meeting this man today has changed my life and I'm eternally thankful. It wasn't long after that, and darkness came over the entire land and gasping for air, Jesus took his final breath. And he cried out, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And there were horrendous claps of thunder and the earth shook and a loud ripping noise came from the Jewish temple and Jesus was dead. My only friend, my brother, my saviour, my God was dead. The centurion who was standing guard just here at the foot of the cross witnessed everything and he too acknowledged surely this was the Son of God. Not long ago the soldiers came and pierced Jesus' side to ensure that he was dead and blood and water flowed from his body. And a friend of Jesus came quickly after that and took his body away for burial. I've since overheard Someone saying that they've sealed his body in a tomb with a large rock and Roman authorities are guarding the entrance. I don't know why they're still harassing him even in his death. Just let him lie in peace. <sighs> the soldiers have just come and broken my legs and I can't stand. And I know that while my life will be over in just a few moments, I'll also enter the newness of what Jesus has prepared for me. And wherever you are, Jesus can change the course of your life. He can write a new story over your future if you just are. Hi, my name's Dan Patterson. I'm so glad that you're with us here at Ashgrove this morning, and I hope you have been touched by what you've heard about the Easter story so far on Good Friday. And I want to invite you over the next few minutes just to lean in personally to consider what this story may mean for you, because the Bible is the kind of book that invites us to see ourselves in its pages, to adopt this story as a script for our own lives. And at the very center of what Easter is all about is about God coming to bridge the gap between us and Him. You see, you and I were created for good. We were created to love God and love each other and to care for God's world, to cultivate this planet, to make it beautiful and, and fruitful. But any world where we can have meaningful lives, any world of meaning is also a world of consequences. And so God created this world such that what you and I do, what we do matters. It affects God and it affects other people and it affects the environment around us, whether to do good, to help, or to do evil, to hurt. And at the heart of the Christian story is God helping us come to grapple with this evil that has itself gripped our own lives. 
You see, so often we cry out for God to fix things, to bring an end to the evil and the suffering, particularly in situations like the pandemic that we now face, to wipe away the hurt. But yet, in doing so, we fail to realize that for God to deal with the mess means that he also has to deal with us. Any global reconciliation, any global restoration actually has to pass through judgment. And because of his great love for us, God doesn't want us to stand judgment on our own record and fail. But rather, he sent his only son, Jesus, into the world in order to save it rather than condemn it. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him, he shall not perish, but have eternal life. And because of God's great love for us, he substituted himself on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. Jesus was despised so that you and I could become God's delight. Jesus was condemned so that you and I could be acquitted. Jesus was forsaken so that you and I could experience God's forgiveness. Jesus was crushed so that you and I could become new creations. Jesus was murdered so that you and I could become eternally alive. This is what the gospel is all about. This is what makes a tragedy like Jesus' death Good Friday. That the travesty of human justice, of an innocent man being condemned to die, was used by God as an act of atonement to be able to bring us, make us again one with God. The story says that Jesus was crucified between two thieves, one on his right and one on his left, which is a curious detail given how often Jesus spoke about those on his right and those on his left as being evidence of two different reactions to people's invitation to trust him. We're told that one thief was hard-hearted, even in the face of death, such that he scoffed at Jesus and turned his back on him. He rejected Jesus. But the other in seeing Jesus crucified and the godliness bleed out of him, that that changed him. It softened him. And recognizing his own sin, that he deserved justice, that he deserved judgment, he simply cried out for mercy and he trusted in Jesus. And you know what? That was enough. That's actually all it takes to have peace with God, forgiveness from God, to be made new again is to recognize your own evil, your sin, and to cry out for mercy and trust in Jesus. You know, Jesus said to him, I truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. That that one act, after a life of thievery, the darkness of his life, that one cry for mercy and his trust in Jesus was all it took for the dawn of an eternity with God to become reality. And that's what you're invited to experience today. You too can have peace with God. And all it takes is for you to believe that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Do you believe this? And if you want to make that step to trust him now, I invite you just to pray along with me, whether out loud or in the quietness of your own house, wherever you are, whatever you've done, bow your head with me now. Let's reach out and put our trust in Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us despite us turning our back on you, despite us so often scoffing at you, despite the questions that we ask, despite all the evil that we've done. You see through it to who you made us to be and you love us as a heavenly father to earthly kids. And you loved us so much that you sent your one and only son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins, to pay our penalty, to be forsaken on our behalf, that we might be forgiven and be welcomed into eternal life of peace with you. I want to pray for all those who are listening right now, that their hearts would be soft, that together we would recognize our sin and that we would reach out and put our trust in Jesus. And we pray in doing so that you would fill us with your presence Wash over our consciences with your forgiveness and help us to walk lives that reflect the love for which we were made and the love which we experience in you. We pray this in Jesus' name.